Okay, so not every transaction in Zcash is private. Some transactions are public and there are some benefits to allowing public transactions, not only when it comes to ad adoption from exchanges as well as from wallets, but also in the sense that it allows some level of audibility. So you, if there were more coins going out of the shielded point than going into the shielded point, coin, pool, sorry, you would know that there was something up. So we allow four different types of transactions, transparent to transparent, transparent to private, which um, I shall refer to as being like putting coins into the shielded pool, private to private, which is like shuffling coins around the private pool, and then private to transparent, which is like taking coins out of the private pool. Transparent to transparent transactions are essentially like Bitcoin transactions. While the recipient can create a new address whenever they want to receive their coins, the spender always has to spend their coins from the same address with which they received them. And moreover, the amount is totally public. It is now fairly widely established that unless users are very, very careful, this provides no real meaningful level of anonymity. Shielded transactions, or Z to Z, were what were initially proposed in the Zcash paper in S&P back in 2014. These hide the recipient address, the spender address, and the amount being spent. And largely what we found with, was that with so little information to go on, it was very hard to make any meaningful deductions about what was going on with these kinds of transactions. What was more interesting was when we were looking at money going into the pool and money coming out of the pool. When putting money into the pool, you know the spender address. When taking money out of the pool, you know the recipient address. And in both situations, you know the amount. So in this situation, we do actually have some information to analyze. Okay, this um, chart might not be totally accurate anymore because it's from back in February. But this is a breakdown of the different types of transactions which we were able to find over the blockchain network. About 85% of transactions did not interact with the shielded pool at all. Um, so this includes the T2T -T transactions that I was talking about earlier, as well as coin gen transactions, which are where you're creating new coins. Of the remaining 15%, very few were private to private. I think it was like 1%. I also think it has improved since, but at the time it was really very small. Of the other things, you had um, T to Z and C to T, which I mentioned. You also had this mixed category, which was where you had both interaction with the pool and a public um, spender address and a public recipient address, and we saw a few of those. In Zcash, all newly generated coins are sent either to miners and founders. And these are the primary people that are using the shielded pool, essentially because they have to. By protocol, they cannot spend their coins until they have been through the pool. Miners, who are responsible for maintaining the system, really do not seem to care at all about their anonymity. They're not even trying. Founders, so the initial creators, investors, um, maintainers of the system, were also behaving in a semi-automated uh, fashion. First things first, we looked at the money being put into the pool. Now in this situation, it's um, actually trivial to identify both miners and founders because founders' addresses are public. And the miners' addresses you could identify by looking at the coin gen transaction, ignoring all of the addresses which were founder addresses. Everything else belonged to a miner. So we just put them all in a big list, and whenever one of those addresses came up when they were putting money into the pool, we had tagged it as being miner or founder, whatever was appropriate. As you can see, the miners are behaving in a very linear fashion. The founders were not. The founders were occasionally putting in some very large transactions. And this was, um, 
actually can be seen in the big black one as well as the small blue one, which is the line corresponding to the founders. This is my favorite graph from the paper, so I included it here for want of a better place to put it. This is showing the amount of money being put into the pool versus the amount of money being taken out of the pool over time. So the red on the top is money into the pool, the blue on the bottom is money coming out of the pool. As you can see, they are a near perfect reflection of each other, with only a couple of places really straying from this image. One of them, the second blue point that you can see, was actually made on Christmas Day. There were a thousand um, coins that were taken out of the pool and split between 10 recipients, so we thought that might be some kind of Christmas Day payout. And there was some other interesting stuff going on there. So in total, when applying our heuristics, we found that we were able to identify about 70% of transactions going out of the pool with either miners or founders. When we just applied no heuristics at all, but used standard Bitcoin clustering techniques, we didn't find very much. But when we applied our heuristics with the founders, we identified a few more, and with the miners, we identified quite a lot more. For our founders heuristic, we noticed that 75% of all founder transactions being put into the pool were of just shy of 250 coins. We also found that there were nearly 2,000 withdrawals from the um, pool of exactly 250.0001 zip cash. So we figured that maybe there was something automated going on here. So additionally, we then started looking at the intervals of the transactions. And we found that with the deposits, the um, 250 chunks were largely going in at six block intervals apart. We also found that the 250 chunks coming out were coming out at six block intervals apart, which we thought was an unlikely enough coincidence that we let it define our founder's heuristic. When it came to identifying miners, we took advantage of the fact that most mining activity happens from mining pools, and that many of these mining pools behave in a very regular fashion. So on the slides there is a breakdown of the different um, mining pools that I got from the Z-Chain Explorer. I think the two biggest ones are Fly Pool and Fly Two Pool. With lots of these pools, what they were doing is when they were withdrawing their funds from the pool, they were instantly splitting the funds amongst all the different people in the pool in the same transaction. So you would find transactions with just huge numbers of recipients. One example I found on the board. This was, um, this I found just by looking through the Explorer for a couple of minutes because these transactions are all over the, all over the chain. And the first one I stumbled across had 300 recipients. So what does this mean for other users? Essentially, all it means is that the anonymity set that you're, you think you're hiding amongst is actually much smaller than it first appears. One heuristic, um, which was developed by Jeffrey Kersnell, um, identifies a deposit as being linked to a withdrawal if they are of the exact same amount. And this amount can be found um, only once on the entire blockchain. When we applied this heuristic, we found that we were able to correlate about 30% of these withdrawals and deposits. But most of them had already been identified as minor or founder transactions. So actually, we only improved our result by about 2 or 3%. One case study that we um, decided to look at was um, regarding a hacker collective called the Shadow Brokers, who were offering to sell hacker leaks, which apparently they had obtained from the NSA. And the reason we thought we stood a chance here was because the amounts they were asking for were very, very large, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So they're not that typical, particularly when you're looking at private transactions. We found that we knew exactly what they were asking for, because they publicized this. 
So on the table, it's a different amount they were asking in different months. Some months they had different packages, so they would offer different amounts. We found that there was one user who was a new user, and they first appeared in May. I think they might have been an actually properly new user because they first experimented by transacting with very small quantities before using the pool. This user paid 100 um, coins into the pool in June, 200 in July, and 500 in August, exactly matching the Shadow Brokers prices. So I thought I'd come up with a couple of recommendations to users giving our results. First thing, things first, try not to deposit and withdraw your coins from the shielded pool in the same block. Um, a second, with uh, Jeffrey Kesnell's heuristic, the simplest way to avoid this is to withdraw and deposit different amounts. Uh, one other thing that we saw quite a lot is when people were putting money into the pool, they would be wanting to put in a very precise amount into the pool, probably to pay someone. And what they were doing is they were taking their change back into a transparent address so we could tell exactly how much they were intending to pay. If you were to take your change into a private address, this would be harder to glean information from. And last but not least, if the withdrawal and deposit address can be identified using standard Bitcoin clustering techniques, then we'll be able to link the two. But of course, a secure system is, should never depend on users for its security. And actually, I think it shouldn't depend on the miners either. The miners are not invested in the system. They don't care. At least as far as anonymity is concerned. Um, so what you can do, the most obvious one is to just behave in a less regular fashion if you're a founder, which um, would mean that there would be a guaranteed anonymity set of 10% of all coins, so that would be very useful. Of course, it would be better if more people were using the pool full stop. And ultimately, none of our heuristics would have worked on a fully private system. The developers are already working on many of these things. Like I say, they have already totally changed the way they're claiming the founder's reward. I haven't looked at precisely how, but I'm sure it's much harder to figure out what's going on there. They're looking into wallet upgrades. They're doing this sapling upgrade, which should help people actually use the private functionality. When it comes to a fully private system, this is really something that the community has to weigh up. There are downsides, some of them technical. One of the technical downsides, which I think is linked to this trusted setup, um, would be helped if there were alternative methods. We've been looking at alternatives to a trusted setup scheme for zero-knowledge snarks. So please check out that work. It's not totally trustless, but what you have is you have that any user can join at any time to add their own randomness to the circuit. And what's more, the um, circuit is universal in the sense that if you wanted to change the way the Zcash circuit worked, you could use the same parameters. You wouldn't have to generate them afresh. Thank you very much.